welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, on today's discussion, which will be about the war of Russian world in Ukraine. Um, our keynote speaker today is um, Grigory Mesezhnikov. Um, Mr. Mesezhnikov is a co-founder, is the co-founder of the Institute for Public uh, Affairs, Ivo, based in Slovakia, where he has been working since June 1997 and has served as its president since March 1999, while also being the director of the domestic politics program. Uh, he is the graduate of the Faculty of Arts of the Moscow State University. Uh, during 1983 to 93, so for 10 years, he worked at the Come uh, sorry, he worked for the Komenivs University in Bratislava, and uh, during the period of 93 to 97, he worked also at the Political Science Cabinet of the Slovak Academy of Sciences. Moreover, from 94 to 98, he served as a secretary of the Slovak Association for Political Science. Sciences. He has also lectured at the Trnava University's Department of Political Science in Slovakia. He regularly analyzes Slovak political developments for both domestic and international media. Uh, he is a co-editor and co-author of various publications, uh, including the Global Report on Slovakia. Um, so, uh, Mr. Mesezhnikov, uh, thank you very much again for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. It's my big pleasure to be with you today uh, to share uh, my opinion about the topic which was presented in the poster. Uh, thank you very much for organizers for Institute of Advanced uh, Studies. Uh, thank you to Mr. Uh, Ferenc Mislivit for inviting me and, of course, for Horsola Ratz for transferring uh, this invitation. My pleasure. Thank, thank you for Yeah, thank you. Uh, just maybe a couple of uh, personal, I would say, testimonies. I was born in Soviet Union uh, and more than 40, 41 years I live in Slovakia, first in Czechoslovakia. Part of my family originated from Ukraine. It's my father was born in Ukraine. My mother was born in Russia. Both were Jewish, so I, I originated from Jewish family. And of course, uh, what is happening today in, in this territory, in this region, of course, has uh, some personal con connotations for me. But my positions and how my approach to what is, what is happening there it's not related to my region or the place of the birth of my parents, but uh, it's about the perception of uh, this war through the optics of values, principles, and norms. And of course, uh, the title of my, of my presentation, of my lecture, is a play on words, because in Russian language, in Russian language, uh, the word for designation of world and peace is the same word, the word mir. However, today in Ukraine, the Russian world, so Ruski mir, means Russian war, not Russian peace, but Russian war. Uh, Ukraine is today fighting for its national survival, for sustainability of its national statehood, and uh, is fighting for many other things. I think that not inevitably related to Ukraine itself, for example, for freedom, for democracy, for dignity, for European or universal values, for civilization, I would say. But in the context which I will be speak about today, I think that it's fighting firstly against the Russian world. It's one of the most remarkable events, I think, in the modern human history. Looking ahead of my presentation, I would have to say that concept of Russian world is nothing but tool of war, either hybrid or at the end, as now we see, a normal military conflict, military war. So tool of Russian military aggression. And if I think Russian state will persist in its current form after the war, we don't know how it will finish, what will be the results. But after, after this war, if the same, if the Russian state will exist under the 
same name as today, Russian Federation with same leadership, Vladimir Putin, and with the same concept, which is part of Russian foreign policy doctrine, I think that this concept will be always full of war. Uh, similarly, as the meaning of word mir in Russian is ambiguous, the meaning of term Ruski mir, so Russian world, is ambiguous too. For someone, it's an already existent reality, so something which already exists. For, some, for someone, it's uh, just an ideological construction or rather ideational stream. But for current Russia's political regime, it's a tool for creation of reality. Since the beginning of uh, 2000 years, it's a part of the foreign policy doctrine of the state named Russian Federation. Now, a couple of names which are related with the Russian world. Some of these names are quite famous, some are less, less known. Uh, the first author who used this, uh, this uh, term, Russian world, uh, he used this occasionally, was a uh, liberal historian and liberal thinker in Russia, Mikhail Gefter. He was dissident, de facto dissident thinker, and he didn't develop this concept. He just used this term, Russian world, and he was, that time, it was at the end of uh, 80s, beginning of, of 90s, he was thinking about uh, softening the consequences of the dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, uh, avoidance of the cataclysms and conflicts in relations between nations and newly established nation state for communication between nations with the shared experience of totalitarianism. And he saw a peculiar and important role of democratizing and non-imperial Russia with its legacy of resistance to the regime, for example, dissidents for settlements of relations between Russia and other uh, former republics of Soviet Union. However, I have to say the overall development quickly turned into a completely different direction. Uh, and the Russian world and the concept of Russian world started to be described, interpreted as a cultural historical idea of international, interstate, even intercontinental uh, community. And this idea was uh, 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 directed to unification of the dispersed or separated Russian language uh, compatriots, Russian or Russian language speaking compatriots. And uh, the so-called political technologies were offered itself as a vehicle for promotion and practical implementation of this idea. Uh, according to uh, opinion of on, on many researchers in the current uh, scientific and political discourse, this term Russian world was brought in 1993, 1997 by two persons, uh, Pyotr Shedrovitsky and Yefim Ostrovsky. Uh, however, they do not pretend to be the authors, but de facto they first time used this term as something which after this had a political consequences. Uh, these uh, two uh, gentlemen, they were authors of the uh, authors and promoters of the method of games, institutional organizational games. So they were very popular. Um, many enterprises and, and organizations uh, commissioned them for uh, these games with different results. So as it, for testing for some social and political proposals. So it means that when they started to develop this concept. Also, they were uh, less thinking about ethnic, ethnic uh, connotation and political consequences just as a description of some, some objective reality that according, according to them that uh, under the pressure of tectonic, historic shifts, world wars, other events, uh, some communities were formed, uh, bigger and smaller, and these communities were, uh, uh, were created by the persons speaking or thinking uh, in, in a Russian language. 
Uh, so the initial formulations were rather rather uh, connected with the idea of maybe today we would say the soft power or maybe influence of uh, Russian speaking diaspora in other countries. But gradually it was broadened to the definitions which uh, are related to the Russian world as a objectively existing uh, space, which is tending to be closer to Russia, to the territory of Russia. And even the irredenty, irredentism was a part of this, became a part of this concept as a justified tool of promotion of this, of this concept, a, a tool for promotion of uh, activities, ideas related to the ethnic Russians or Russian speaking persons for building of their national state. So uh, according to those who started to use this concept as a, a political technological project, Russian world suddenly became hypothetical international transcontinental community, which was uh, united by their belonging to the Russia, to their loyalty to Russian culture, and uh, it became uh, be perceived as an integrationist an integration project or strategy in diaspora. However, of course, uh, still some, some scholars considered this Russian world concept as a uh, concept which reflects uh, geopolitical and sociocultural socio reality. So it means that something as a Russian world already exists or existed at the time, however, is fragmented and split, splinted. Uh, and of course, there were some people who still still perceived uh, perceived this concept as a, as a just something which is chimeric, some idea which uh, exists but uh, doesn't reflect reality. But how we see to the, today, I think that in the in the reality, and uh, this is the core of my next presentation that uh, de facto, the concept of Russian world in, is invasive, expansionist, reconstructionist concept, which is putting Russia as a imperial entity against the outer world, and which uh, justifies aggression of Russia uh, against other states, especially neighboring states, uh, and which uh, consider Russians and Russian speaking people who live in other countries, first as a promoters of the policies of Russian regime, and second as a additional argument for justification of the activity steps, acts which are uh, directed uh, uh, immediately against this, these countries in which this Russian people, people of Russian origin live, including, as now we see uh, in Ukraine, it's even about conquering the state. So who was uh, the person who really implemented, incorporated uh, this concept into official Russian foreign policy doctrine was Vladislav Surkov. I think that this name is uh, generally known. He was a uh, close, I, uh, AD of Putin, he was Vladimir Putin. He was working for different projects inside Putin's, uh, Putin's uh, administration. And uh, he, as a first, he started to speak about separated nations, so Russians as a separated nation. Uh, then the Russian world is going far beyond of Russian of Russia's border. So the Russian uh, uh, world, according to Surkov, and now I am, I am quoting, it's everywhere when people see in Russian model of national development alt the alternative for themselves, for alternative to other options which uh, are presented in their homelands. So this Russian world is more important for these people, should be more important. Uh, 
to uh, to uh, these people uh, everywhere when Putin is welcomed and uh, respected and uh, quite symptomatically, unfortunately, from the point of view of today events, everywhere when people are afraid of Russian weapons. So it, it was a direct quotation from Vladislav Surkov. Of course, it's a lot of another uh, quotations of him, uh, which that time indicated that something toxic is becoming inside uh, inside the Russian political discourse and these very strange ideas, even for first sight, quite aggressive for external world, uh, became a part, part of foreign policy. Uh, now, what is the relation between Ukraine and Russian world? I think that uh, relation is quite direct today and the whole concept uh, which considers Russian speaking persons, Russians, already Russians, uh, definitely is making Ukraine as a subject for, it, uh, for attention, the territory of Ukraine, uh, for attention of policies of Russian, Russian state. We uh, know uh, quite uh, the title of relatively known uh, book uh, written by Leonid Kuchma, uh, the former president of Ukraine, who was considered as a pro-Russian, pro-Russian in terms of uh, stronger orientation of Ukrainian statehood development to Russia, but at the same time, uh, of course, supporting the idea of Ukrainians, Ukrainian independence. independence. He has written a book with the quite symptom symptomatic title, Ukraine is not Russia. But it was clear for Ukrainians, it was clear for many sc uh, scholars dealing with the history of Ukraine, it was clear for all more or less adequate politicians, but it wasn't clear for the theorists of, uh, of Russian, Russian world. And not only Surko, but also such prominent person who, who today pretends to be one of the leaders of this opinion stream, Alexander Dugin. Also, I could uh, quote from, uh, from his different works. Uh, the last, his, in quotation mark, war, work was his very lengthy interview to daily Moskovsky Komsomolets in which he was describing uh, the, this concept as a concept of not only peculiar Russian civilization based on different values, not compatible with the values of the West, but also according to him, it's a, it's a concept which is leading Russia as a state to the dominance in the world. So not only the peculiar civilization, but also, also the prospects of dominance of Russia in the, in the whole world. Uh, of course, he is now justifying the war. I will, speak, I will be speaking more about the reasons of this war, how I, how I see and how it is related with Vladimir Putin. But I think that Alexander Dugin also contributed to the preparation of this war. Because uh, according to his concept, uh, during the seven, seven centuries, uh, the Moscow, which is uh, embodiment of the Russian world, was fighting against the so-called Western Russians. And Western Russians are Ukrainians. He is not pronouncing even uh, the name Ukrainians, but Western Russians uh, around, the, around the Kiev. So according to him, since uh, that time, uh, the Kievans, so Western Russians, they were collaborationists of uh, the West and the West the whole of this time was provoking Western Russians against, against the real Russian world. And now uh, uh, the task of the Russian world represented by Vladimir Putin in this military conflict is just to conquer, uh, conquer Kiev. So the siege of Kiev, he, he gave this interview maybe two, three weeks ago when really Russian troops were 
quite close to Kiev. So this process of besieging Kiev, according to him, was the final fight of the Russian world for, uh, for treasonous, uh, traitors, Western, Western Russians. Well, now uh, a couple of words about inevitably of war, inevitably of this war. If we are, uh, if we are reading uh, the articles or other uh, references, of Russian world authors, uh, of Russian world concept, all these uh, Kremlin politi polit political scientists, so-called polit political technologies, but also Vladimir Putin himself. I think that it was clear that Ukraine is in the focus of, uh, of uh, expansion, uh, of geopolitical expansion. Uh, so the question whether uh, in a, a war was in inevitable, I think, uh, that uh, the simple and short question uh, answer is yes. So, uh, uh, personally, myself, it happened to me in this very narrow context in Slovakia that maybe uh, the, quite the opposite to some or maybe prevailing number of uh, experts in, in Slovakia, but not only in Slovakia, who didn't expect the war because they were assessing the rational arguments against the war. So insufficient number of Russian troops, well, uh, a better preparedness of Ukrainian troops for, uh, for fighting against aggression, the motivation of Ukrainians and other, other uh, rational factors. Uh, and these experts uh, proceeding from evaluation of these factors, they rather predicted or they accounted rather with the non-military, non-full-scale military conflict. Uh, my prediction that I was that I admitted that it can happen. It happened. It happened first, of course, uh, because uh, maybe my reading of Russian world is that in any proper moment of time, in any situation in which the forces of Russian world feel that they have opportunity to do something, they are using this opportunity. And uh, a part of this, I was uh, assessing on also not this material, uh, material rational arguments against the invasion, against the real invasion, and I didn't consider this as just a bluff, was my evaluation of uh, ideological background of uh, Vladimir Putin as a, as a leader of Russia. Uh, I think that uh, some of his characteristics are very favorable, I would say, for creation of the situations in which Russia is attacking other countries. First, he is archaic politician. So he, he, was, he is not speaking about the future. He is speaking rather about the past. And I think the three R letters characterize this as a leader. So it's a revisionism, revanchism, and uh, reconstruction. So he is a revisionist, revisionist politician. So he admits that uh, something would happen in the history to different countries, especially to Russia, can be fixed. Those who are responsible for something wrong doing, yeah, for something happened unfavorable to other countries, these responsible either persons, states, or institutions, they should be punished. So they should be punished. Really. So it means that he is revanchist also. And he admits that the old forms, obsolete or existing before all these forms, with, with, the, some, with the disappearing or disappeared, they can be restored. And uh, it was this uh, three, or oh, the third R letter uh, uh, applied to Putin. So he is a reconstru reconstructionist. And he, he showed this in 2014. Not only in Crimea, maybe in Crimea it was just uh, revisionism, but in so-called Donetsk and Lugansk, regions, 
it was the full reconstruction, even uh, the Soviet, some elements of Soviet, even Soviet regime, not even Russian regime, which, which existed and still formally exists in Russia, but in these two regions, formerly separatist entities, de facto uh, created by the Russian state and fully ad in administrative sense, military sense, economic sense, and all other sense, they were just the affiliated, affiliated territories in com completely ruled by the Russia. But in these territories, some social forms typical even for Soviet Union, Soviet Russia, even some Stal during the Stalin's, Stalin's era were uh, established and reconstructed. It's something which we cannot see in any other, any other territory of the former so-called Eastern Bloc. Now, I think that also what I, what I was analyzing and somehow I was applying in, in my, evaluation of the situation, three Putin's obsessions. So a part of this reconstructionist, revisionist, revanchist uh, setup, also three his constant ob obsessions. The first obsession, and I think that all three, all these three obsessions, they are related to Russian world. Now I will explain. The first obsession was uh, full rejection of the Ukraine as a, separate uh, entity, state entity, nation state, statehood, Ukrainian statehood, and Ukrainians as a separate ethnic entity. So according to Putin, Ukrainians simply doesn't exist. From time to time, he was using uh, uh, this word, but in the context, it was clear that he do doesn't consider Ukrainian nation as a separate nation. He was speaking, uh, uh, constantly about three branches of the Russian nation. He was speaking about the United Nation. He, he has written several articles about this. The last, maybe very famous, which was a de facto historic and uh, in quotation, uh, quotation mark, ethnological justification of Russian aggression against Ukraine was his article published in Kremlin Rue website, but also in uh, some Russian pro-governmental periodicals uh, about the historic unity of Russians and uh, Russia and Ukraine. It was published in July 2021. Uh, I think it's my hypothesis that uh, at the beginning of his uh, uh, presidency, and maybe even before Vladimir Putin had this kind of perception of Ukraine, even if he wasn't openly speaking, rejecting uh, Ukrainians as a separate entity as he is doing now. Why I think that it was typical for him even before 2014, because I, I read uh, some of his texts in which he was speaking or, or maybe transcripts of his speeches when he was speaking about Ukraine, but all this about Ukraine in some connection with Russia. He wasn't speaking about Ukraine as a part of broader international community, Europe or other countries. All this he was speaking or he was writing about Ukraine only as a partner of Russia, as a close country to Russia uh, in all terms, political, economic, uh, ethnic, and so on. Ukraine was all, uh, already uh, always appearing in his mind as a something which was related to Russia. But of course, that time probably it wasn't proper time to openly demonstrate his intent to uh, destroy Ukrainian uh, nationhood or at least to uh, annex maybe Ukraine or to incorporate Ukraine in something broader. But I think that. This his idea, uh, refusal of Ukraine as a separate entity. I think that it was his part of his uh, mental world. So uh, it, it's the first obsession. The second obsession is his interpretation of the destiny of Soviet Union. And of course, it's also related to the Russian world. As Ukraine, of course, uh, directly related to Russian world, the 
uh, the collapse of communism uh, and, co and collapse of Soviet Union, he described as a, the biggest geopolitical catastrophe in the 20th century. So of course, I don't, I don't want now to somehow to, uh, to, poly to polemize with this. I, this idea is absolutely false and uh, absolutely inadequate because uh, many nations of the former Soviet Union finally have got the opportunity to develop itself in their national states on the principles of democracy, freedom, of course, if they opted for this. But, but according to Vladimir Putin, uh, it was a big geopolitical catastrophe. And of course, what is the relation to the Russian world? I think that quite uh, understandable that uh, Russia, de facto, as he was speaking about this, Russia lost. I mean, not this, that Soviet Union collapsed and the nations of other republics uh, gained something, but uh, the Russia, Russia lost. Russia lost its influence, Russia lost its it, uh, contacts, Russia uh, lost uh, its uh, uh, potential to be kind of uh, the force which can be integrator of this uh, territory as it was before. So I think that it's, uh, it, it has direct connotation with the Russian world. And the third uh, obsession which I think is also quite present in uh, Vladimir Putin's way of thinking, is a perception of the West as a genuine enemy and anti-Russian predator. So all these uh, complaints, uh, allegations, accusations, criticism of the West, that uh, it was West who not only wanted uh, Russia to, to be weaker, and uh, directly involving in activities uh, of weakening of Russia, but also that the West provoked all other republics, the former republics of the Soviet Union, to be anti-Russian, the Baltic states, Caucasus nations. But firstly, and today, maybe the most importantly, Ukraine. Even in his, in his uh, this mentioned, uh, article, but also in some of his other speeches, he was speaking about Ukraine, that Ukraine is developing, developing as an anti-Russia. So uh, for me, all these, all these elements of his approach to the past, to the, to the neighboring countries, especially to Ukraine, I think from this point of view, I admitted that this war would happen, it happened, and I think that it's, uh, now we see, looking back, that this war was inevitable. Of course, it's only, it's not, I mean, uh, not only one uh, factors why this war happened, why uh, Putin decided to, uh, to go military to Ukraine, there were some other, some other uh, factors, and, uh, I think I, I can I can elaborate a bit maybe more about uh, about this uh, some internal domestic of course factors then factors directly related to Ukraine and then maybe factors related to the West. So I will start from the from the uh, former from the latest. I mean uh, there are frequently appearing uh, opinions that. Uh, Putin uh, thinking about uh, Russian invasion to Ukraine, Putin somehow underestimated the West. Well, I disagree with this. I disagree. I think that Putin just evaluated uh, the possible positions of the West after invasion as the continuation of the previous trends. So he I think that he didn't underestimate at all. He quite estimated according to the practices which were obvious since 2014 till the last days before, uh, before the war. So sanctions was in, uh, implemented, imposed, but they were not very painful sanctions. Uh, world leaders were speaking about uh, 
high level of isolation of Russian state in the international arena, but it wasn't the case. Russia wasn't uh, isolated. Uh, these economic sanctions were not very painful. Political san sanctions were not very targeted. Moreover, I think that Russia invented the ways how to avoid these sanctions. Russia cooperated with other, other countries in this, in avoiding the sanctions. So it means that one of the reasons why Putin, a part of others, and I will tell probably a bit more about others, why Putin decided to go to war, because he expected that the West will behave as it behaved before. And we see uh, how some countries, even after the war started, were hesitating to impose the stricter sanctions than before. Let's say Germany. Germany is a special case. I will tell you about Germany uh, in, some other, in some other aspects uh, a bit later. But uh, it, uh, it took Germany a couple of days and maybe even weeks when, uh, when uh, the German leadership uh, changed, uh, changed uh, their approach. And they changed this under the pressure, of course, of what was happening and still is happening in the battleground, but also under uh, the pressure from uh, the local population, German population, and also from the partners in the European Union and NATO. But again, I think that Putin, when he was thinking about invasion, he was that time adequately evaluating the possible Western reaction because Western offered, Western uh, community that time offered him the example. So, but then of course, there are some other reasons. The, I think that the most, uh, uh, visible, probably most understandable domestic factor, a domestic from the point of view of Russia, was that this kind of regime and Vladimir Putin is a, Vladimir Putin's regime is a authoritarian today. I think uh, almost totalitarian regime. It's it's a rock state. It's a rock state which is uh, completely violating of uh, violating uh, all uh, rules and norms of international relations, international law, but, but domestically is a regime which uh, started to fail in fulfillment of its initial social contract with the population. The initial social contract with the population was that uh, just don't care about politics, we will provide you good conditions of life, but uh, the regime simply didn't have potential to modernize Russia. I think that the fact that Vladimir Putin, he looks only to the past, and of course it can be applied to the development in the country, all these so-called modernizing, modernizing projects completely failed, and uh, the social, social policy were not very helpful for people in perception, and we know this from the point of view, uh, from the opinion, uh, Paul's point of view. So it means that uh, it was more and more clear that without mobilization on the wave of the victorious war, something expansionist, external expansionist stops, uh, this regime simply cannot find enough support for itself for survival and for keeping the power. I think it was the main main uh, factor, domestic factor, uh, why this war happened. But also uh, there were some other factors related to Ukraine. And here we see how development in Ukraine contradicted uh, the main postulates of this Russian world concept. First, uh, Ukraine was evidently successful in consolidation of its national statehood and even prospects for development of the statehood, regardless of internal political turbulences, in conditions of the permanent military conflict in the East, in conditions of uh, really very destructive consequences of this conflict, uh, uh, the consequences of activities of Russian fifth column in political scene if you, in, this, in, in Ukraine, still this state was democratic, uh, persisting as a state with the stability of institutions, and more importantly, for huge support of the population for nation statehood. Even the rising, uh, rising level of national 
consciousness in the eastern part of the country. So it's the second reason. Yeah, so it's known phenomenon that in the central part and the western part of Ukraine, the level of self uh, consciousness of Ukrainians as a Ukra as a Ukrainians and citizens of Ukraine is higher than in the east. But also, the last years uh, were bringing more and more. Uh, persons with the highest level of uh, pro-Ukrainian consciousness. Uh, and I think that uh, the third very important factor, which was perceived uh, Putin very negatively from the beginning, and it was that time, uh, the reason of decision of him to, uh, the effort was to strangle uh, the Maidan, but uh, by taking some territories from Ukraine and then to infiltrate to by infiltrating to the political body of Ukraine, uh, but today it was even more more visible uh, that uh, Ukrainian society was clear in their or its option for European future of Ukraine. So it's a prevailing trend in uh, was in public opinion support for European integration. Uh, it's understandable that uh, for a big part of Ukrainian, uh, the joining the, the Euro integration project was a better and more secure way for democratic reforms, but also for providing more security, external security for the state face-to-face uh, -face, uh, Russian uh, that time, hi either hybrid threats or maybe uh, maybe verbal aggressions, aggression, aggressive uh, expressions uh, uh, from uh, from Russia. Now, uh, two other. If I have at least ten minutes more, uh, maybe if you could conclude in uh, five hmm. minutes, and then uh, maybe okay. we can come back to it. Thank you. Okay, now uh, I think the two things which uh, I, I, I cannot avoid because these are very, for us and for Ukraine, they have a uh, vital importance. The situation of war in Ukraine now, I don't want to repeat what you know, of course, from, from the reports, from news. Uh, I think that what is now Russians are doing uh, after this failure in conquering Kiev, after all these terrible bombardments, all these uh, uh, war crimes and so on, what is Russia is doing? Russia is trying to conquer the eastern part of Slovakia, uh, of of Ukraine, and to depopulate to depopulate this part of the Ukrainian territory. So, how to de depopulate? By uh, uh, pushing people from from this region as a refugees. Partially, the estimate is it's terrible, 600,000 of Ukrainians were deported in the, and dispersed on the territory of Russian Federation, which is also a war crime, but also uh, killing people and, uh, and devastating this part of the territory in order to completely destroy the attractiveness of this territory for any possible economic projects after the war. So not to uh, allow, objectively, not to allow these people to, to return to this area. Of course, definitely not in the areas which probably will be uh, controlled by the Russian, but, on, but also in other regions, let's say in Kharkiv or Chernihiv, uh, the previously uh, flourishing, flourishing cities which are completely destroyed. So what, they, what Russians want is a kind of punishment simply to devastate these areas, to depopulate them de facto, and to keep uh, the population uh, far from this, re from this region. So it's my, as I uh, estimate now, the main aim of, uh, of the Russian military operation. And the second thing is related to us. It's relevant for, uh, for us. I mean, how the West can sustain? What now to do with, with this rock state? which is absolutely violating all possible norms, which is behavior as a terrorist entity. I mean, uh, again, after war, this war will finish, we don't know the results. We don't know what will be the situation in the, 
in the battleground, but we know that once this war will finish, maybe it will be truth, maybe it, it will, I, so I don't think that it will be real peace, maybe it will be just truth, but I mean, how coexist with this, with this international actor? Uh, so how to do with the nuclear power rock state? It's really not a simple question. Maybe we can discuss uh, now after the end of my presentation. But I think, and uh, now I am finishing, I think that for the West, specifically for the West, which is based on democratic universal values, liberties and freedoms, and especially on the legacy of anti-Nazi and anti-fascist struggle during the Second World, World War, I think that the West should finally not only uh, re uh, re uh, realize, but also recognize and openly declare that this state today, which exists under the name of Russian Federation, is not the same state which defeated the Nazi and fascism, Nazism and fascism, and even this state is not a successor of the, of the state which was victorious in the Second World War. So it, this state, in any sense, absolutely different. This state is rather ideologically close to those states which were defeated during the Second World War, and we, sh and we should finish to treat this state as the state who was a before part of international community which succeeded to, to defeat that time the biggest uh, the biggest evil and especially and uh, this is my this is my final sentence uh, sentence is especially this uh treatment and this approach should be applied by germany which overestimated the role of uh, the current russia in uh, in the whole this discourse and now we see that one of the results of this is just the more aggressive uh, behavior of Russia. Thank you very much for your attention. I am looking forward to your remarks, uh, questions, and maybe some considerations.